Um, I'm going to describe the system. Sorry, I have a uh, cold, so my voice is not sounding too good today, but I guess I can stand here. Here. Okay. So this is a system for creating tech, uh, 3D scenes from natural language, so very simple natural language descriptions. And um, also describe, so the outline of what I want to, I'll talk about, and then I'll do a demo at the end a little bit. Um, so essentially, what's the motivation for this? Um, some background, so the history of this project over the years. Um, then sort of talk about how it works. Um, some linguistic stuff, spatial relations. And then some applications for this that we've been testing. And then, um, then I'll show kind of whatever you guys want to look at. Okay, so motivation for this was um, I used to work in 3D graphics at Symbolics and then uh, Nietzsche Graphics, creating 3D graphics tools. And I never wound up using them because it was just so tedious to use. I wanted something really easy to use. So that's sort of the, the motivation for this is to kind of abstract away and have a simpler kind of application, a simpler way to interact with graphics. So cause if you ask why is it hard, you know, this is typical, typical graphics authoring tool. You have you know, zillions of menus. You have to spend all this time learning them. And then to do anything, you have to follow the, the path that they've set for you. Also, you're working at a very low level of detail. So typically, you're looking at polygons, vertices, uh, you know, all the, the very low components where if you want to create graphics quickly, you might want to just deal with objects. So it's sort of you know, most of these authoring tools are at the wrong level for that. And then there's just the, the, sec the uh, sort of aspect of training, the time and skill and expense it takes to learn this stuff. So, you know, popular package is Maya and, you know, costs, depending what options you get with it, you know, a couple thousand dollars or more. And there's books and you can take courses on this. So I wanted to get away from all of that kind of stuff. So the idea is to create uh, graphics from language. So here's a um, scene on the system. You read at the bottom is the text that created it. And then it was rendered with uh, reflections and shadows and light sources. So I'll just read this one. It says, Santa Claus is on the White Mountain Range. He is blue. It is cloudy. The large yellow illuminator is in front of him. That's with the light sources. The alien is in front of him. The mountain range is silver. So you have six sentences or so, and you get a pretty interesting scene. So the interface for this, there's a, there's a web interface, and basically on the left side you type your text, and then on the right side you um, get a picture and you can move around in 3D. And it, it just does that by sending a JPEG and recomputing for you. So you describe your scene. Uh, so this is the scene we just uh, saw. Then you click display, and then you get a preview of that scene. So this is just rendered with OpenGL and sort of simple shading and everything. Uh, then you can move your uh, camera, your 3D viewpoint around. So you click on these buttons here. It'll recompute it, send you a new one pretty quick. And then um, you basically get the sort of com the, uh, the view you want. And you add more, more objects. You kind of iterate on this. And then you can click on Final Render if you like it. And then th that's sort of the difference with the rendered scene. You'll get reflections and light sources, um, more obvious, you know, the shadows and that kind of thing. And then if you like the picture, you can then, so the website also supports um, putting it into a gallery. So you can then post it and other people can look at it. And so these, these are pictures, this grid up there, some pictures in the gallery, um, comments over here. And you can also link pictures together into like a little story. So that's kind of the idea of how you might use these pictures or sort of show them to people. These are some other examples. So here's more text here. So you can get, after a while, you can get quite a, quite a bit of text, but you work a little by little. You set it up the way you want. This is one using uh, scenes inside of a scene. So this picture up there was actually rendered in the system, and then it was incorporated into the scene, just referred to textually. OK, so just sort of the overview of this, is the, sort of the, what I've talked about so far is just the motivation is to avoid GUIs, to just describe something. So you give up all kinds of control, level of control, but you can get something quicker and um, you know, it's just, if, if that's it's a trade-off you're making. Um, and because of that, there's a lower entry barrier. You can just start doing it. You don't have to learn anything. Um, you're trading off, as I said, direct manipulation for speed. One interesting thing, so if you think of language, language encodes constraints directly. So if you say the, the water bottle is on the table, the table is against the wall, it, you just basically set up some constraints. And the, when you move, the, the table is moved against the wall, the water bottle will move with it. Typical 3D system, you move the table, you have to do a separate thing to move the water bottle. Select it or constrain it explicitly. So in language, it just sort of happens automatically. 
So that's one reason it's, um, it has potential for being easier to use in this way. Um, another is it's more flexible. You, you can do things, you can say the water's on the table, there's, um, the table has a water bottle on it. You can refer to things in different ways the way you might want to say it. If the system can interpret those, then um, you're free to think about what you want to do less than the path that you have to go through, and you can do it the quickest way. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, objects versus polygons. You're just saying water bottle. You're not saying this vertex and that vertex. So, um, and then because you're using language, this sort of this is a po you know, potential to use other kinds of applications. So, where the language is important itself. So we've been looking at education in particular um, as a way for kids to use language and sort of increase their literacy skills in different ways. So I'll talk a little about that. Okay. So um, I'll go to the background and system overview. So there's been a few different iterations of the system. So the original version I did with Richard Sprout at AT&T Labs back in 2001. We did a paper at SIGGRAPH on it. Um, then a few years later, um, well, I was no longer at AT&T and Richard wasn't either. And we worked on a, a version we put on the web, which is basically the same functionality of it. Um, it didn't have verbs and poses, which is still kind of something we're adding into the system. So th the system's basically dealing with spatial relations, sizes, colors, and that kind of thing. Um, and I'll explain about verbs and poses later more. And then, now we're working on a new version. This, we're doing this at Columbia. Um, I'm back in school working my PhD, and this is sort of in computational linguistics, and this is sort of the project that's sort of guiding what I'm doing. Um, so we have an NSF grant to do this. And what we're concentrating on is verb semantics. So if you describe something with those verbs, what, is, how do you, what does that mean? So there's, there's a resource called FrameNet and other things that can help you do that, but you need to translate that into graphical relations. Um, we're using FaceGen, which is a uh, software commercial package that can generate faces with different facial expressions, like happy, sad, and so forth. So adding to the capability that way. And we're trying to acquire contextual knowledge via Mechanical Turk and other ways so you can know about the world. So um, if you talk about a room and you say someone sat on, you know, went to the living room and sat, on, sat down, you might know there's a couch there and not a lawn chair or something. So what kind of objects are located in what places and that kind of thing. And um, so this is all in the works. I'm mostly going to show kind of what it, what it does is, is pretty much up here. I'll show a little of this. So hopefully in the next, the sometime this year, we'll get more of the, the new stuff in there. We're all working on this now. And then I'll talk about the middle school summer program we worked on with kids using the system. So as far as the system components, what's in it, the, um, all the custom stuff is written in Common Lisp and runs on Linux, um, CMUCL, and SBCL. It uh, also runs on ListWorks, but I don't, the actual running system, I just run it on the Mac with that. OpenGL is used for um, all the 3D previewing. Uh, we use, for the ray tracing, we use Radiance, which is an open source ray tracing renderer. Um, and then in the, you can do various 2D post-processing effects in the, in the system. And we use ImageMagick and GIMP to do that kind of stuff. Um, and then sort of, there's the core system, then there's also the web server. So for the web server, use Allegro Serve for that more Lisp, and then MySQL with CL SQL to control that for keeping track of all the users, all the pictures that they've created, and so forth. And then the hardware configuration is there's one front-end web server and then N back-end picture servers, which are really just running on a multi-core machine that just has like 12 Lisp processes running and it picks one. Okay, so if you look at the problem, what do you, you know, so what do you need to depict the 3D scene? So there's sort of two p main parts. There's the language end and then there's the graphics end. So the linguistic analysis is parsing, so that's sort of creating a, a structure from the words into noun phrases, verb phrases, and so forth. There's um, semantic analysis, which is, okay, well now that you have a parse tree, what does it actually mean? So those are different things. And there's reference resolution. If you say it or refer to the same object twice, do you know is that the same object or not? Um, okay, so then once you have some sort of meaning, then you have to depicted in, in a graphical term. So for that, what you need to, 3D objects. So if you refer to you know, a bottle, you need some sort of bottle and you need a table and so forth. So you need objects, you need spatial relations. So if you look at any scene, what is that composed out of? It's objects, they're related spatially, they have sizes, orientation. Um, there could be groups of objects. They could have color and textures. Um, if it's a human, they could have a pose, be in a certain pose like this or something, facial expressions. Um, then there's other object states and so forth. And then there's our con uh, sort of uh, configurations of multiple objects, like a room. So if you say, you know, the garden or the living room, that's not one object. It's sort of a bunch of objects constrained in some way. So this is sort of just 
it's a sort of like way to think about the problem, and you know, we try to do try to do as much as that as we can. Okay, so for, as far as the uh, what's in the system, we have 2,000 3D objects, 10,000 images. So the images can be used as textures, so the texture maps, um, and just some pictures of them. And they're all they all have meta information associated with them, telling you what is the object, what parts does it have, if it knows that. That comes from the 3D library. Um, if it's an image, it'll know what the image is a picture of. Like, so this is a bird, some sort of bird. And Abraham Lincoln's in that one. So these are annotated. So if you, if you want a certain texture, you can get that in a certain object. As far as I talk about attributes and sizes and colors, so here we have transparency, um, colors of a red heart and this transparent barrel. Um, here we have this, so the sizes. We have this three foot long battleship, and it's yellow on its brick cow. The one thing you can notice is if you, if you change the color of something or put a texture on it, you don't necessarily want the whole thing turning that color. So, like the cow's horns are still white and his nose and eyes are black and so forth. Um, so, the, uh, it's just sort of one thing, you know, if you're using the system, you kind of find out, well, it's really more natural when you say something has a color or a texture, it's really not the whole thing, it's some dominant part on it. So, the objects know that also. I mentioned uh, reference resolution. So, there's an afro, which is when you use pronouns like it and so forth. So the system will resolve those. Um, so we said the duck is in the sea. It is upside down. The sea is shiny and transparent. The apple is three inches below the duck. It is in front of the duck. And then we say it is partly cloudy. Well, that's a different kind of it. That's sort of the global environment. Um, and then also attributes can be used as, ref as uh, ways to dereference things or co-reference things. So we say the first dog is blue. The first dog is this. The second dog is red. So it's the attribute that's telling you those are different dogs, right? So you can't just look at dog, you have to look at what attributes are on it, and then that, that will tell you that it's a... It's a um, poses and facial expressions, so here uh, we have... Uh, so this is using face jam, we have on the right, we have Obama is angry and afraid. So <laughs> <laughs> Looking at some dragon, and um, so there's uh, just a few things in that. We're, this is adding a lot of... We want to add inferencing on the system. So if you have some sort of just general verb like John uh, scared Mary or something like that, maybe he's looking angry and she's looking scared. Or, you know, so the verb, you're not saying she is scared, you say he scared her. So there's a different way of saying it. Or maybe he, he punched her, maybe she's uh, you know, in pain. There's an expression from that. So whatever the um, action is, you might want to infer what the emotion is, and which is sort of shown via spatial expression. And um, for verbs, you know, here we have the clown is running. So, this is there's only a few verbs in the system currently. We're, that's kind of what we're really working on, but um, we want to translate to poses. So, if someone's talking, you want to know are they standing, are they sitting? Um, what's a canonical way of you know you're looking at the person usually when you're talking to them. So all of that stuff you, you want to know. Um, here's another with facial expressions. With Obama again. So you can in FaceGen you can take any photograph that's sort of straight on and create a 3D model of it. So that's how we got him. Okay, and then there's, uh, you can do stuff with environment, change the time of day, cloudiness, lighting. Um, these, are all, these are from the old system. I'm not sure if the new one is doing this yet, but um, probably can. So you, know, you can make night scenes, day scenes. You can take the time of day. It'll put the sun at the right place and so forth. Okay, then um, some, some sort of issues that come up. So a lot of, we have 2,000 objects, but that's not you know, everything. So, if an object doesn't exist, it has to do something. So um, one thing it could do, if you say foo is on the table, it'll make 3D extruded text and put that on the table. So it's sort of, it's a fallback thing it can do when it doesn't have the object. Um, over here, we said fox is on the table. Um, so there we don't have a 3D object of a fox. It can take a picture of it, texture map it on something, and do that. So you're still getting the meaning across, even though the picture won't be sort of literally what you meant. Um, you can also find a related object. So if you said the robin is on the table, here we just took a bird that sort of can denote the set of, uh, you know, other sort of more specific kinds of birds. And it's also using 2D cutouts. So we said the farmer is to the left of Santa, and if you could see, that farmer is actually just an image that has a, a mat channel around it and then is um, put into the scene. So if you moved on the side, you wouldn't see him. He'd be completely flat. But you can still, it's, it's easier to get images than 3D objects. So this is sort of a, Another sort of easy fallback to do. Okay, then you can also do um, interpret uh, adjectives as textures. So it's sort of a, or, or basically interpret, uh, yeah. So here we have, we say the American horse. It can put a flag on something. We say the stone horse. In that case, you'll 
We want a stone texture. Um, here we have Richard Sproat as a horse on the horse. And here we have, uh, here's a different use of an adjective using it as to select a kind of object. So the Chinese house is so sort of a subclass as opposed to modifying an existing object. So that's sort of like some things there. Okay, so now looking at sort of how some of this works, uh, spatial relations is obviously a key thing because you're really, you're putting objects together to create a scene. So if you have like sentences like this, the cat is on the chair, the bird is in the cage, the picture's on the wall, the vase is on the shelf. What do you need to know to do that? Um, and you need to know something about this is one of the answers. So let's look at one case. We say um, the boat is in the ocean and the dog is in the boat. So we have the same word in, but it's getting interpreted different ways. So in the boat in the water, that's sort of embedded in something, right? That's like you could say the, the lamp post is in the ground or the stake is in the ground or something. It's, it's sort of part of it is embedded in, whereas the dog is in the boat, it's a containment thing. It's sort of a, in a sort of cupped area and the dog is in that area. So this picture shows sort of how those two would, would um, be used in one picture. And this will depend on the object shape and, and the function of the object. So the system works by having these spatial tags on objects. So it knows for every object where different regions are. What's the base of it? It doesn't have a cupped region. Not all do, but if they do, it'll mark that. Where on would be. So if you say something's on the chair, you'd want it over there, not sort of on some bounding box above it. You want to know exactly you know, where, where could it be. Um, canopies would be if it's in the, it's under the chair. There's a region there. So it's basically giving more information at the geometric level that the system can then use. Rather than trying to, like, you know, you could try to compute it from the polygon and figure that out, but it's, it's, it's easier in a way just to put a cube there and, and mark it. So that's what it does. And there's a few others there. So here's using the stem and the cup. So if you say the daisies and the test tube, what you want is the stem of the daisy and the test tube. And if it knows those parts, it can do those kind of things. And here's using um, enclosure and on. So the bird is in the cage and the bird cage is on the chair and it's using, knows where the surface of the chair is and it knows where inside the cage is. And this is a picture that kind of shows just a bunch of different spatial relations. You can see like we have the apples on the wall, we have the pictures on the wall. So because one's flat and kind of generally goes on flat surfaces, you put it in the front, whereas the apple is not and that'll put that on the top. And so there's all kinds of just different interpretations of the same word and so forth. And this kind of shows you the, some of the features of the objects that it uses to, to make those decisions. Okay, so now uh, talk about a little bit, so we're going to working on now is frame semantics and the SBLR. That's basically the SBLR is scenario-based lexical resource. It's essentially knowledge about words and their meaning and how they're kind of used in context. So this is kind of what we're trying to acquire knowledge about. And frame semantics, it has to do with how verbs denote meaning. So we're sort of basing this on something called FrameNet, which is a digital lexical resource developed at Berkeley. Um, and basically, the, the idea of a frame is this sort of a schematic representation of some sort of meaning. So a situation, object, or event that provides the background and motivation for the existence and everyday use of words in a language. And then, what, and then the grouping of words with common semantics. So if you say, like, I ran to the store, I walked to the store, whatever, it, it's basically the same frame there. You, you know, there's a place you're going from, where you're going, it might be a path I walked across the field to the store, I could run across the field to the store. The field would be the area or the path, the store is where I'm going, maybe I went from home. So basically, that's defined by the frame, and then every verb in that can use every instance of uh, sort of the uh, syntactic patterns in the verbs, you know, what the direct object is and the subject and so forth, will map to those frame elements. Um, so in frame that, there's about a thousand uh, frames, about 10,000 lexical units, which are verbs, nouns, and so forth. And they, they have an annotated, uh, a whole bunch of annotated sentences in it showing you which with valence patterns, which are kind of the, uh, those patterns of well, the direct object. If you say walk to the store, if you have the prepositional phrase to the store, there's a, um, the goal would be denoted by the prepositional phrase to and then something. So those are the patterns and you can kind of derive those from frame net. And then there's relations between frames with like maybe uh, general movement versus self-motion, which is more specific, so the inheritance and so forth. Or buy and sell are different perspectives on the same thing. So this shows um, how meanings are kind of represented in frames and how one frame can relate to another. So in the uh, left frame here, it's a little small, that's the self-motion frame. And there's words like run, swim, walk, <coughs> and so forth. So if you say John ran across the park, 
let's mention the valence pattern for that. That would be the subject. That's the self mover, which is one of these core frame elements. That one right there. And then uh, the area, that's, that would be the park, and that's denoted here by this, pardon, there we are, by a cross. So essentially across the park. So preposition across is kind of signaling that it, it's an area involved. And then that will map this, this co theme frame, that's a more specific frame, that's where two people are moving together. So that's things like pursue, guide, lead, chase, was necessarily two people. And um, so that has its own valence patterns for different verbs, they're all different, potentially. And then there's a mapping between the frame elements in them. So that's kind of the idea of frame net. Um, a frame net has various gaps in it. Um, I don't know how much I should get into all this, but basically there's missing frames. You can imagine you know, there's lots of, lots of verbs, they, and, and they don't necessarily have them all, and maybe there's some frames that are missing also. Um, these valence patterns, the syntactic realizations are kind of sparse, so, um, and there's sometimes mistakes in them, so we, we, we need to kind of beef this thing up a bit. Um, and uh, the relations between frames, so like the inheritance and so forth, is not always uh, sort of encoded in the system when it should be. Also, there's no semantics to differentiate between two things in the same frame, between swim and run, let's say. So um, they're both in the self-motion frame, but how are they different? So frame that doesn't tell you that level. And that's where, you, in, in word's eye, you need to know and a pose that's associated with swimming, maybe something like this, and running would be something else. So um, that's something we have to add as a translation from the frame semantics to, the, let's say, the scene semantics or the visual semantics. Um, and there's a weak type mechanism, which is what I'll talk about. Okay, there's another resource that's useful. It's called WordNet, and this is like a, a dictionary of basically kind of a taxonomy of words with hypernym, hyponym. So basically, what's your parent, what's your children? So um, furniture would include chairs and tables, and chairs would include different kinds of chairs. So um, this, th this has various problems, too, um, with uh, it has mostly single, or a lot of single inheritance. So, for example, princess is under aristocrat, but it's not under a female. So you don't know that, and you really want to know that. Like, just in reference resolution, we said, you know, if we said the princess went to the store and she was happy, you wouldn't have the knowledge you need in WordNet to make that inference. So um, that's the kind of thing we need to add in. Um, and there's other problems. I think I'll just, oh, okay, I'll talk about a few of them. Uh, there's like functional use versus sort of uh, actual use. So if you say a spoon, they classify it as a container because it can contain something. But you would never actually call it a container. So there's a difference between what something is as a functionally versus what it would be called in, as an actual word in language. And that, that, if you try to use WordNet, it will confuse you because you won't know, is this ref is this, if someone said container, is that referring to spoon? You know, and it probably wouldn't be, right? But as far as WordNet's concerned, a, a spoon is a type of container. So, um, and there's other problems like part, there's part-whole relations, which are very sparse, and there's not too many of them. So some examples, it doesn't know a snowball is made of snow, it has uh, shoelaces as part of shoes, but has loafers under shoes, so you'd think it would inherit that part. So anyway, there's just a whole bunch of problems with it. And so part of the, you know, what we need to do is fix those things too. So, um, so the framework of this is we have these semantic relation classes, which are basically from FrameNet. And then we have an ontology of lexical items and semantic nodes, which are kind of like what you get out of WordNet. And then, then there's knowledge about the world, which is lexical um, or, and contextual world knowledge which is represented by instances of these semantic relations. So <coughs> you want to know, for example, that a bookcase contains books, right? that sort of information. And that can be represented by what FrameNet defines as being its frames. And then the, the last component is vignettes, which is if you want to translate from a uh, scene, I mean, from language into a scene, you have to get to graphics somehow. And if you want to say, like, say, wash the car or versus wash dishes, they would take place in completely different places. So what kind of contextual information about the world do you need to know to do that sort of thing? Okay, so here's some examples of simple uh, types where you can resolve something based on the, on the properties of the object. So we have a um, bowl of cherries and some certain conditions, and then that'll be container of, right? And if you say slab of concrete, what does of mean in that case? It'd be made of, right? So the same word of can mean different things in different cases. And I'll skip the rest of them because we have a picture here showing kind of what these look like. So, so here we have a bowl of cats. I probably said bowl of tiny cats or something. Um, here we have a part relation, head of the cow, dimension, so to say the height of something is, right? So anyway, this one word of means all these different things. And you can figure that out in a lot of cases just by the properties of the objects that are um, used in that. 
here's representation, say the picture of a girl, right? So picture of is usually means representing of. It wouldn't be containment or part or something. Okay, so um, part of the knowledge we're, we're sort of trying to get is through Mechanical Turk, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. So we have, um, just say, you know, here's an object, where is it located? Or uh, what parts does this object have? So um, we've been doing this, sort of acquiring knowledge, um, and learn that a schoolhouse has students in it, and lockers, and desks, and blackboards, a mountain, the habitat, so this is the relation, mountain has inhabitants, there's bushes and birds, different things that live there. So it's this example of the kind of stuff we're trying to acquire. Um, we're doing another experiment, with, we did another experiment with Mechanical Turk. We take pi actual pictures and have people describe them to see what language they use, and we have them described in two ways, low level and then high level. So low level is kind of like very, you know, this, this is next to this, very, as low level as the people we can get them to do. Um, and then high level is more the intention, what, what is happening? You know, he's making a phone call, to, or he's angry at somebody or whatever, you're kind of in, inferring what's going on. So this is a way of getting sort of um, ki the kind of language for real scenes that you can make pictures of that we can then focus on for this task. Okay, so just to show then how the, some of these pieces can fit together, there's the, um, the computational flow, so we start with input text, and then, um, so here's an example, the truck chased the man down the road, the road is very long, and then we parse that, so over here we get a parse tree, and this is sort of the list representation of the same parse tree, um, so you get, a, a small, I'm sure you can't see it, but so we have noun phrase, verb phrase, so the truck is the noun phrase, and then chased, and then the man, is that the direct object? And then so down the road, that's a prepositional phrase attached, and that's the structure. And then here's the, um, the uh, sort of the symbolic form of that. Okay, then you want to convert it to a dependency structure, so that this sort of phrase structure, parse representation, are not that convenient because you don't really, it's it's far away from the meaning. So we convert it to dependency links. So this is this is basically all the information that we need that was in the other one. Um, so here we have chase as the main, that's the action, and we have man and truck in yellow, and then one, one of those is the direct object, one's the subject, and then down, and then dependent on that is road. So we convert it to this kind of structure, which looks sort of like that internally. And then, um, oh, here's just another bigger picture of that. So you can see the two. Uh, this is down the long road, I don't know if I had that before. Okay. And then, um, then after that we do reference resolution. So we said, uh, man chased a truck down the road, it was long or something, the road was long. So in this case, these two roads, previously, um, we had these two lexical items, the, you know, the second sentence had a road and the first had a road, and you don't know if those are the same or not. So, um, and sometimes they might not be, depending on the attributes on it and so forth. So the system then unites, unifies them, says, okay, there's one road, and then it's really the same thing. Okay, and then, um, in terms of then, you have, that has to sort of assign semantic roles. We want to convert this verb into some s frames, basically. So there's that chase uh, co-theme frame. There's a theme, the co-theme in the past. So basically the man, the truck, and the road are the three <coughs> frame elements of that. So we convert to that. Um, and then this, this, this part doesn't really do much currently, but we want to add some con context. So like, where would this normally happen? So is it outside? Is it inside? You know, if we say I had dinner, it might be inside a room. If you said, you know, Ran, ran someplace, it might be outside. So um, add some sort of default uh, context. So here we just add the sky and the sun and so forth. And then, then we have to convert this to actual graphical constraints. So all this stuff down here is saying, okay, well, a little small again, but we in pose. So the man is in a pose, the running pose. He's oriented, the truck is oriented with the road. The truck is behind the man. Um, the man is on the road and the truck is on the road. So those six spatial relations kind of uh, are generated from the higher level uh, semantic relation of this chasing going on. Okay, and then here's the picture that it would generate from that. And uh, so you get the truck behind him on the road. And I think I put the tree in just to make it <laughs> look nicer. And then once you have that, you can then um, render, yeah, so this is rendered. Okay, so as far as applications, I mentioned various applications for this. Um, we uh, tested it the summer at um, in a, a um, sort of, I don't know what they call it, it's a uh, enrichment program school kind of thing in Harlem, 
it's called HEAF, Harlem Educational Activities Fund, and they had, um, well, I'll talk about it in detail. So, so just in terms of application, so there's this pilot program we did in Harlem. Um, there's also just generally graphics authoring. So I, mean, I think you can create a picture easily, so it's sort of, there's potential for creating like, social interaction with pictures and so forth. So sort of have a, um, in, the, in the gallery in the system, people can put up pictures and comment on them. And then also 3D games where you can imagine an adventure game or something where you can create parts of the game dynamically by describing them. So those are sort of three applications that areas that seem interesting. Um, now as far as the education one, and this is part of what we're trying to do in, 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 the, in the specific project is, you know, see if it's useful for people, for kids to learn. So we did this program with these sixth graders uh, at the summer program. We met once a week with them for 90 minutes and um, they made, they were reading Animal Farm and Ace of Fables and they made um, pictures, they picked scenes out of that and made pictures that sort of showed what was in those scenes. So um, the idea was to kind of use their imagination to sort of you know, understand the story better and then translate that into the language that the system can deal with, which is much simpler. But sort of that process, you know, we wanted to see does that kind of have value in helping them understand the stories because it's kind of forcing them to think about it. And it's, it's fun, you know, fun process doing it. So, and then we also um, used the face gen thing. We put their faces in the system. And in the last session, we had them put it themselves in scenes. And they really enjoyed doing that. They really enjoyed putting each other in scenes and, and silly, you know, kind of situations. So, and this is sort of just the pictures of different sessions with them. Okay, then to test whether this had any effect or not, we did um, a pre-test and a post-test. And basically, they just had to describe a character from some book and then, um, or we tell a scene, and then these were judged that we had a control group and then the group that used the system, and then they had to, um, uh, those, then those were those, the, the tests were sort of judged by some educator or specialist in literacy, and, um, and the results we got were that the group that used Words Eye, they actually started a bit lower in the pretest because just the random sample of who was in it, and post-test they did better. So there's a, the amount of growth that they showed was significant. And so that was very encouraging because it shows that, that kind of the uh, system has some use for, uh, you know, going through this process kind of made them describe things that think about the characters better. So this sort of pilot study. And we're going to do some more studies in the future. And here's some pictures that they created from Animal Farm and Aces Fables. So here's the uh, tortoise and the hare. And there's some pigs playing cards. I, I can't remember all the scenes. And then they would give titles on them too, which I don't have here. Um, and this picture, so this is showing like the 2D effects that the system can do. They like putting, you know, making it look like a painting or that kind of stuff. And just speaking of education, you know, there's other uses of education. So um, Richard likes making puns, so here's a, one of his puns. And then just other uses, you know, you can make greeting cards out of it. Christmas cards and so forth. Okay, so um, that's, that's the end of that. So basic conclusion, um, so the physical, geometric, all these properties of objects, when, you know, that's really important. So if you want to make scenes out of language, you kind of have to know about objects, what properties they have. Um, you need to know about the world, and we're trying to acquire that through mechanical Turk and so forth. And you need to know about language too. And the uh, the goal is again is to you know applications for the system in education, games, and social interaction. Um, the system is online. The old system is wordseye.com. The new one is this bitly slash wordseye, and so that's the one that'll be changing. The old one is sort of frozen in time, and there's this big gallery of pictures in there. I don't know if I mentioned there's like uh, 10,000 rendered, you know, fully rendered scenes. So it was online for like three years. So it's qu quite a bit of stuff there, and so. It's, you, there's more interesting pictures to look at in that one than the new one. And so that's it. So I'll, I'll do a, I'll, sh I'll show you the system and I can show you a little of the list part two, I guess, since this is a list meeting. Okay, so uh, let's see here. All right, so we you know, just start with something like, all right, so if I, we put in, you know, we'll start with a simple thing and we'll add objects into it. So we say, you know, the cat is on the chair and we'll use some reference resolution say it is uh, pink. So just 
display scene. Okay. So now here we have a cat on the chair. Now if we and then this is, you know, move the camera around. If you want to look at it, you can see it's, it's actually a 3D object. So you can see the wireframe. So that's sort of the polygons behind it. Um, then you can see the chair and the cat that it chose. So the system has a couple cats, the 3D, and then there's some of these cutout 2D cats that you can also choose. Um, and then for chairs, there's probably a dozen or 20 or so. And you can refer to these um, textually. So we could say on the rocking chair, for example. So rocking chair and we'll keep the same view okay so we got the rocking chair or if you want you could just say chair again and then pick pick it graphically so we got a different chair and we could pick any chair we wanted so like the uh, the easy chair let's say and then, okay. so that's kind of the uh, the way the uh, object selection can work then you can add, add other objects in. So you could say, um, I don't know, we want to put a table next to it or something, or a coffee table in front, maybe. So there. So I was talking about also like the um, the language you, know, you want it to be as ex sort of flexible as possible. So I could say a coffee table is in front of the chair. I could say there is a coffee table in front. So it should the system can handle different ways of saying it. So say so there is a coffee table in front of the chair. Okay, so I put it directly in front. So maybe we want, and it will make it looks a little big. So we can make the exact size of the table. So we can say the table. Okay, so we said coffee table, but now we can refer to it as table. So we'll say the table is. Uh, is a small coffee table? Yeah, you could do that too. I'll say the table is small. So you could say the small coffee table. The table is small. The table is three feet wide. You know, however you want. So and then we don't want it directly in front. So maybe we want it. Uh, because yeah, they're putting up a touching, so maybe I'll put it, coffee, there's a coffee table uh, two feet in front of the chair. So hopefully that will work. And that didn't. Let's see. Mm -hmm. chair. Uh, put, okay. This sometimes happens. It puts feet. And when you say feet, it's sort of ambiguous. No. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So put feet in the scene. So we don't want real feet. Okay, so, um, there's a coffee that, yeah, in front of the chair. Probably if I said it, yes, it's there. Let's see. And so if you say the coffee table, and try it this way, is three feet in front of the chair. Yeah, okay. So it really should have handled that other case. Because um, you know, in this thing, you use dimension so much, you don't want interpreting feet as being actual feet. Um, so we don't want a three feet, so maybe we can put a fraction of 1.5 feet in front of the chair. Well, that didn't work. Oh, meters? Yeah, I think so. How many lines of code is Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot of it's a lot of code. Um, there's a lot of 3D objects and data, and then there's also you know graphics code and language code, and all kinds of different parts. Fifty thousand, hundred thousand. Uh, well, um, I can tell you how many files there are. <laughs> you want to know? Let's see. Um, let's see how we do this. Okay, well, you know, there's all these files. <laughs> so, of course, these are, you know, backup files and all kinds of stuff. But, you know, so there's probably a couple, oh, there's probably a couple hundred files. I don't know. Depends on the size. But back to browser. Okay, so, um, yeah, let's see here. Coffee table is... What's that? Near the front. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, three object front, okay. Um, yeah. So, that, yeah, I put one there. Um, this would probably, yeah, I, it's hard to tell because everything's sort of flux. I, you know, I think this kind of thing would work in the old system, but this one is sort of. Does it recognize which, can you say the cat is on the chair, which is pink, and then have the chair be pink? Oh, that's a good one. I should try that. Okay. The cat is on the chair, which is pink. Probably not, but we'll see. Is there an easy way to watch the internal representation? Yeah. Oh, to watch it? Um, well, I can... 
to look at. Yeah, I haven't done that. I want to do that. <coughs> you can, uh, we can actually do it, we could do it here since we have a list open. So we could actually say, um, so we're going to parse this, <coughs> excuse me. You know, basically the internal representation would be the parse, right, in the dependency tree. So the cat is on the chair, which is pink. That's what we typed. Okay, so here's the parse tree of that. And then we could graph that. Uh, graph is parse. Okay, so look at that. So here. Okay, so here's the... Um, I like change the size of this. Okay, so we have um, the cat is the subject uh, is on the chair, which it looks basically right to me. Yeah. Um, now we the dependency structure. We can do if we do it this way. So we got that, and then we'll um, look at that. <coughs> Okay, so I lost the pink with, from the witch. So, <coughs> excuse me, that hasn't, um, part hasn't been, the semantics or analysis of the parts, she hasn't extracted that part yet, but it has the cat on the chair. Um, I'll show some more examples of that kind of internal structure. Um, so I have, I've been working on that recently. So, like, here's one. So, so these are test sentences. There are three people in the room sitting in the orange chairs. So, if we do a, um, Get the dependency structure. There's a bunch of different interpretations. We'll pick one of those, and we can look at that. And uh, okay, so let me change the size of this. Maybe it's ambiguous. It tries to find all the different interpretations. It finds them all, right? And then um, we might want to present those. Sometimes we present them to the user. Which one did you mean? Um, you know, you want to rule out ones that are implausible, and this. So it's kind of, I think there's a line between something that's, uh, you know, sort of sensibly ambiguous, you know, it just might be silly or whatever, but some versus something that you wouldn't use language in that way at all. This sort of like clashes with the language. A lot of times if you have like a certain, certain um, preposition attached to a certain noun, they just would never do that, but it's sort of, if you're just dealing with the syntax at the level of attaching it to, at that level, it would be, you know, grammatical, but so, so in this case we have, you know, so we said the, uh, you can kind of read these things. It says, okay, well, in the, we have people in the room, and then the people are sitting, and then this dependent clause in, or dependent phrase in, chairs, and then those chairs are orange, okay? So this then actually gets processed further. This is sort of one stage of it. You then want the orange actually to be not just an attribute hanging off, maybe, but like a, um, a relation itself, the, uh, you know, the, the cardinality of three, you might want to say this is a collection. So there's a, there's a bit of processing you do after this. But this basically shows the semantics that you want to use to then create the picture. So um, this is basically, how, that's how the system works. So it parses it into that other structure, which is not so useful, and you go to the dependency structure, and then you go to the graphics. Yeah. Is it massively time to make all those photos? Because the, the system doesn't actually draw those photos on the ad hoc. It's well, like a database of photos. No, because they're not photos. They're 3D objects. Right, so they're, they're, they're polygonal 3D objects. So there's a library of those. There's like 2,000 of those. Right. And then when you... How did you get them? How did you make them? Oh, I didn't make them. No, we, there's places, there's like companies that can license those and, and get them free. We basically bought the 3D objects yeah. and, then, and then this is basically a, a natural language interface to a database of 3D objects. Well, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's an interface to the database, but it uses, it's a natural language program that uses the database to do what it wants to do, right? Right. Um, and, yeah. Now, how did you feel that you know, like list and list macros made your life easier versus say Python or anything? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I I mean I, I just uh, why is list good? Basically, you were asking. Kind of Python and LTK. Like if you were to do yeah. the same type of project in Python and LTK. I, you know, I don't I don't know. I have to do it to know. I mean, I use I just I've always used I used to work at Symbolics. I kind of use list and stuck with it. So, um, I mean, basically. Uh, it's just very convenient. You don't have to worry about syntax. The uh, you, know, you can kind of write macros. Right, exactly. You can write macros that do sort of things automatically. Um, you have you know like just doing just debugging things. You have an interpreter here. You know, so I can just you know okay. Well, here's the stuff. I can look at some object. I could describe it. So we have people there. Maybe it's like if we take part of that. Let's see. Oops, wrong one. 
Okay, so this is a lexical item for people, and it says plural. Maybe it got that wrong, and I want to find out why. I can describe that, and I can look at the parse node in there. So just, in, you know, you can write little programs really quickly as you're debugging and so forth. So um, it's just the style of interacting with the computer that, with Lisp, I find it just, um, there's nothing ever you can't do. You can just basically, at any point, go into any data structure you want and look at it and write little code on the fly, um, you know, so I don't, I don't know exactly what Python makes easy to do or not, but, um, you know, so Lisp that's all easy. So, yeah. um. The, the ones we showed the people were just, we, we just chose ones out of comic books and so forth that were sort of the kinds of scenes we want to deal with. Mm, from a 3D scene or from a 2D no, scene? No, we don't. No, actually. Just the scene <coughs> right. It seems to me a limiting factor here is, well, I come from the machine learning background, so training material uh -huh. for the system. Now, right. you have the forward, mm -hmm. you don't have a way of converting an uh, adaptive representation into the parse to your any representation of the data like Right, right. So this is not um, the, w we're looking, well, let's just say, um, as far as, yeah, going from, I mean, there's, there's different aspects of this. One is going from pictures into scenes. I mean, you're, not, you're never going to get good information out of a photograph to figure out the 3D relations, right? So you might do some machine learning thing to kind of figure out, well, maybe there's a cat in there and there's a this in there, but you're not going to know, you know, what it is really on someone, you know, labeled it by hand, well, there's a cat in front of this. So I don't really think that's feasible to gain information about the world from pictures at the level we need it. Um, so this is sort of, you know, we're engineering essentially anything that's needed. So like all those 3D objects, they have the spatial regions on them. So that's essentially a tag that's sort of put on by people, right? You the ch part of the chair where you might sit on or the underneath the table and so forth. So um, you might, you know, you could approach, and that was maybe something you could do computationally with, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, geometric, uh, analysis of the object to figure out where the regions are and so forth. Um, at the language end, I mean, FrameNet, for example, so that's a frame semantic representation of meaning, mapping it to words, right? So with that, um, that was all designed by linguists, right? So it wasn't done by machine learning, it was done by linguists looking at language and what are kind of the key roles that express themselves, in sort of, you know, different syntactic patterns. and and putting that together. And WordNet is another one of those kind of things. So um, the, on the other hand, then, like, let's say the acquiring or just general knowledge about the world, like let's say what, what objects are in what locations. Um, for that, you can, uh, Richard Sprott, who I worked on in this, he's done, he did something where trying to learn like uh, which actions would take place in what location. So like eating breakfast might take place in a kitchen, right? Or um, uh, washing your hands might take place in a bathroom. So uh, that kind of thing you can possibly learn from text by machine learning or different kind of statistical methods. So, so I think basically different approaches apply to different parts of it. And then the idea is that if you have all this knowledge, how do you put it together? And also, how do you identify what you need in the first place? Like, what do you need to do this, right? And so that's way above some level of machine learning to say, well, what do you need? You know, well, we need to know about the shape of objects. We need to know about language and all this stuff. And then try to construct kind of the, the, the set of stuff that you would need to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are problems with the data set, not with the idea, right? Well, it's actually both. It, it's the data set has problems, right? But the idea is is not fully um, is not expressive enough to 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 sort of express the things you need. Like so, FrameNet, for example, has richer structure to things, right? Every every word is in a frame, and then it can refer to frame elements in that frame. So if you say like Let's say you say something like bridge, okay? So you say the bridge to New York or the bridge across the river. Um, that's something, that's, a, that's just a noun which is in WordNet, but it, there's no way to encode that information, right? That it's really referring to a frame which has, it's a bridge is something with a direction that spans across something, right? So, um, no, I think WordNet is lacking in both, both sides. I mean, it's, it has useful stuff in there, but it's really kind of, um, underpowered in terms of the expressivity of it and then it has partly because of that but also just 
for whatever reason, has these problems with the, you know, it's not consistent in the what it, what it means by the relations it does have. It has like six main relations, you know, part whole, uh, hypernym, hypernym, and it's not really consistent. It doesn't mean, you know, multiple inheritance. Another big problem with WordNet is polysity, which is when you have the same word, the same meaning of word basically, but um, it has different shades of meaning, like, so they, like bank. So, so they say bank, that could be river bank, which is one meaning, but then it's like the bank where you get your money. But the bank where you get your money has like, well, there's the institution, there's the building, um, maybe there's some others. So, or, uh, so a lot of words are that way. So there's like a cluster, some that are the same, and then another one's completely different. And WordNet doesn't encode that well either. It just, you know, you might be able to say, well, these, these might be in some hierarchy closer together than this other one, but they might not be either. So. For regarding the, the data holes, mm -hmm. um, for that, and I guess for a frame do those projects now have ways for you, so you're filling, trying to fill in the right. holes, do they have ways for you to contribute that back to them? Um, yeah, probably. I mean, we haven't been thinking about too much about that yet, but mm -hmm. like the, uh, with FrameNet, for example, there's another project called VerbNet, which is uh, verb patterns, and that could be a way to kind of hypothesize some of the missing stuff in FrameNet. So, um, yeah, we, we've talked to the FrameNet you know, people there, so you know, hopefully once we get further along with you know, developing this, we can you know, get stuff back into it. But this is also going beyond that, too, because it's sort of, you know, we're concerned with the 3D representation, or the sort of the, uh, you know, the difference between swimming and running, for example, is not something FrameNet encodes, but it's important to us. So, and there's that too, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that you could use composites. I mean, you, you could actually build a scene and use the whole scene. Oh, and you did the picture, the, the rendered picture, right. How do you actually do that? Oh, okay, it's just, it's just sort of a hack in a way. It's just basically, you give it a name, or the system actually gives it a name, and then you just use it as a texture. So remember, we said the American horse, the, you know, whatever, you can use any word as a texture. So you can then, you could, so if you render a scene and you say, well, the scene 45 pictures on the wall, it'll put it on the wall. So that's all it did. Um, I mean, I guess in theory, you could look at the text that generated that and maybe you try to infer that, but, you know. I, I don't know. I don't know how, how many specialized, there are specialized domains of these kind of things to put these things useful things. Protein training modeling, structural modeling, for instance. I mean, you have structural motifs. Mm -hmm. And these are composed of simple elements. You have some loops, you have pieces, you mm -hmm. have what are sheet data sheets and whatever. So somebody hypothesizing how working codes they know only the sequence and not the structure, wanted to model it. Mm -hmm. These days they do some computational, really expensive things basically. Mm -hmm. I I can imagine something like this where within five minutes they can have a basic model up on the screen uh -huh. to play with. <laughs> just to see what right, as a way to get started and then yeah. Exactly. yeah. I mean, that could be right. I mean, just using, just saying a word and getting the object without having to go through a menu is kind of a nice exactly. thing, right? I mean, you could say, you know, three-turn data sheet and it's all right. Right, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, that's, that's sort of right. Uh, um, an easy you could have, I mean, that doesn't kind of require all the other stuff we're trying to do, but you could just sort of say, yeah, you know, list, type in four names of things, they show up, and then you kind of move them around or something. Yeah. Is that possible today? I mean, can you take something you build and actually manipulate it? Like, I mean, you show motion or rotation. Yeah. Well, not in this, I mean, in theory, you could. it's a 3D object, but not in here, okay, not in this. Like that. Yeah, I mean, you could, out, yeah, I guess you could, out, right, exactly, export it. Yeah. I mean, um, in fact, you wouldn't even have to load it in and export it. You would just basically just tell the other thing, here's the, here's the scene graph, basically, and the files could be pointed to indirectly, and then it would just load them in. You yeah. export from Blender, import, export from Blender objects. Uh, Oh yeah, in theory. I mean, the the objects themselves, we didn't get them from Blender because we just kind of got a whole bunch at once. Um, I'll show you those. So. Catalog. Okay, so there's um, all these different objects. Yeah, here's like this stereo, right? So um, then super nodes, that's like what's above it. So it's a, uh, this is just some information. It's, it's a stereo system. So any 3D object is a subclass of kind of a word in WordNet, let's say, right? Um, so, and then it knows the size, it knows um, the front and the back of it. There's all kinds of information it knows about things. Um, and so in theory, you, if you had a Blender object or any kind of object, you could just, you know, say, okay, here's the file and um, here's the information about it. What is it? What parts does it have? Uh, how big is it? Whatever. And then system could use it. 
Right, so it's you know, 3D objects are not easy to get, you know, just because they're all different and everything. But there's no conceptual problem. It's just more of a organization, you know, finding what we want that and you know, put it in. Yeah. Do you have a way to deal with clear contradictions, like the apple is above the banana and then dot, you know, period, the banana is above the apple. Right. It'll it'll um, detect because it tries to satisfy the constraints, and it'll say, well, I can't do it, so it'll fail, and then it'll tell you, um, oh, yeah, it should, yeah. Let me. Like yeah. Well, okay. We don't have to do that. Yeah. But right. Right. So so basically, the constraints are, and that's a key. I didn't talk about that at all. But basically, so you know, you get for your, you go from your, you know, your text into the syntax, into the semantics, into the three D relations, and then you have to make a scene out of it. So to do that, you have to sort of satisfy these constraints of this is to the left and this is to the right and so forth. And sometimes it's impossible. And then more commonly, is it's under constraints, so you don't really know where to put things. So if I just say, you know. The, the dog and the cat are on the table, for example, right? It, it will... Let's see what happens. Dog and the cat are on the table. You don't want them in the same position, right? Because they should be separated from each other. So it puts one next to the other. So stuff like that, where it's under constrained, you want to um, add constraints. And then the op thing you said was, if you have something over constraints that is impossible, it should tell you that, and then the user can adjust. You know, uh, so to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious. Um, how would you describe the difference between what you built? Amazing stuff in the ancient uh, uh, shrewd loop, I think. Uh, uh, shrewd, oh, the Winograd thing? Yeah, out of 72 or something. Is it the uh, many orders of magnitude to more things rather than blocks and cubes and triangles? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, I think probably, right, because you're dealing with blocks and using triangles, I, I, I don't know the details of exactly what that did, but um, y you can't, you can't, all these subtleties in spatial relations, you know, if you say something's under something, right, a block and a cube and a triangle, there's only one way to be under it, basically. It's kind of, you know, the, it's, it's a bounding box kind of a thing, whereas tables have different ways of being under them, and you can be in things in different ways, so all of that com complexity on the, sort of the ge geometric, Properties of objects, uh, different kinds of objects, is something they don't have to deal with. Um, the uh, and then likewise, okay, if, if you want to deal with um, verbs and this kind of stuff, with you know somebody doing something and chasing, there's no poses they can be in. There's no facial expression. So um, I think probably they you know they had a, probably a lot of you know, sort of logical inference in that much smaller domain, and maybe it could go further. I don't I don't know exactly. Um, whereas we're basically trying to deal with something broader to cover at least you know some semblance of what you might want to describe in, you know, in real life, although it's still smaller than reality, but at least, you know, enough that you can kind of get, you know, sort of reasonable little pictures across. Are so, you considering yeah. adding uh, movement in through the back in the 70s, that uh -huh. you can pipe, you know, uh, move the red block uh, uh, right. on top of a green box? Or oh, I see, yeah. Like um, yeah, well, um, so that would be a, well, there's sort of two aspects two questions that one is like animation as a graphical thing of things moving but the other is sort of sort of this state by state thing they move this here where you kind of just you have one scene and you're saying create another scene from this where you've moved it you're not saying where it is you're saying you know, this other object already move it here so it's more like an instruction set that's using the previous state so um, that's kind of a those are sort of two different things um, the but I haven't really yeah we haven't really thought about either one I guess I guess um, the anima animating the scene is something that, you know, it's very hard to like make animations look good. So if you want to like have someone do something, you know, human come and walk and you know do something, you know, people at Pixar and these places get paid a lot of money to make those things look good. If you try to do it automatically, it always looks stiff and you're very you know dorky. So I, I kind of like the idea of a comic book where you can sort of suggest what's happening with simpler objects. You know, it would be nice though, to have some sort of motion, maybe some sort of ambient. You know, maybe. If there's a person, you could be talking, or you know, or like you ever seen the, the one thing I looked at recently is this thing called Extra Normal. It has like you type in dialogue, <laughs> and it and it creates um, YouTube videos. You know, what's that? Mm -hmm. YouTube videos. Yeah, you know exactly right. So, but what they do, I mean, you basically type in dialogue, you, you create the scene you like and the characters you want, and you just select it, and then it just adds those dialogue, and, then, and people just kind of move their heads a little bit and stuff. <laughs> so, this would be that would be kind of. Um, that kind of thing would be applicable here and easy to do in a way because your scene is constructed and then you just need to talk. So you have some TTS system attached to it to do the talking 
and you just need a little bit of ambient motion and you know move your camera around and stuff you know cut, cutting going from one scene to the next right you know sort of or one camera shot to the next so that's the kind of animation that I'd like to try well, back in the um, 60s people that I saw I actually built a robot uh, it was called it mm -hmm. the same thing it was they tell it to pick up the ball and uh, put it in the box you know but they would describe it the same way uh -huh. and shaky helped shaky for a reason mm -hmm. go pick you know, like that but they go pick the ball up and tremble up the inclined plane you know, and, and drop the ball into the box so uh -huh. He yeah, actually did it. <laughs> yeah, they did. Well. Uh, again, they're all dead now. Yeah, right. When you animate, there's that thing that you use, you know, when you tween something, you mm -hmm. take it from one and it smooths out the process. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to write something that would do that so that you would be moving in small, so instead of going mm -hmm. from here to here, right. you have that tweening process? Um, for like, are you talking about objects moving? In a much more natural motion. More natural than sort of here just to here, like you usually see in a, a programs that are trying to animate something, but they don't quite have. Oh, okay, okay. Sort of bad, oh, bad animation. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of what animators do, and, and I mean you can. I mean, I, well, it's been a while since I, I sort of followed all the packages that do you know sort of animation, but I mean the, all those things have tweening. The, all three D systems have that kind of thing built in. So you give a keyframe here, you give a keyframe here. And it interpolates between those. Hand cell drawn stuff tends to be, you know, you can have problems like that more easily because someone drew a cell at this place and then one at this place, and if they didn't time it right, it'll look jerky <coughs> or something. But I think most 3D generated animations would have tweening just sort of. But tweening can look bad actually. So, I mean, that's part of what mo a lot of animations look bad because they just do this linear tweening and it looks very unnatural because things don't really move like that, right? It's sort of like, you move faster and slower certain ways and at times, and um, capturing that or figuring out how to do that is hard. And that's that's why they use like uh, motion capture. Is, you know, trying to animate that by hand is tough, but motion capture you just have an actor doing it, and you get the exact movement the way you want it. So, um, yeah. But you know, I'm not really. That's sort of beyond what this project is because it's um, that's really getting into animation and stuff, and it sort of opens up whole new cans of worms and problems. So, there's enough in this. Diagramming the meaning. Uh huh. Oh right, right. Uh, uh, do you run into in building your constraints? Is there fundamental problems with the understanding of linguistics and how to break apart sentences, or is it that we don't have a rich enough taxonomy of relationships uh, when when mm -hmm. trying to make these assumptions about like chairs in front of the table? We have a lot of any knowledge about mm -hmm. you know. Right. Is it a problem with the methods of extraction, or is there just not enough test cases, or what's the accuracy of the WordNet and accurately, you know, pulling apart sentences? Yeah. Well, okay. So yes, yeah, so basically, WordNet and FrameNet really WordNet does nothing for pulling apart sentences. It's just basically nouns. It's just single words and some sort of taxonomy. FrameNet gives you information you can use more to do that because it tells you a verb, what the syntactic patterns are for it. Like you know, um, you know. You, uh, the preposi basically prepositional phrases and direct objects and that stuff. Which prepositions kind of do what? So, um, but it doesn't, but to so get to what you say, the, a lot of times to choose, if you have two prepositional phrases that are possible, and the way you choose between them is based on the semantic type of the object involved. So if you say, if you say I um, talked on the phone, you're probably holding the phone, right? But we say, you know, I talked on the top of the mountain or something, then you're standing on the mountain because that's a location. So the types of the objects involved change the semantic representation. In the case of like with frame that would mean a different frame role, frame element that you want to map it to. So that's exactly the kind of thing you know we're trying to acquire is knowledge of that, you know, sort of what semantic constraints can help you decide which frame role it is, fill in more of the syntax within frame that itself, you know, so that we can recognize that even though they don't know that this they haven't said in their annotated sentences that this um, verb takes this preposition, we can deduce that it probably does because related verbs via verb net and other things sort of lead you to believe that it does. So um, that's the kind of that's what we're trying to do. So there's definitely a lot of uh, you know ambiguity and just lack of knowledge that you need to kind of 
you know, sort of pull. Like anything, you said, uh, anything, there's a lot of ambiguity surrounding it. So when, when it comes to that ambiguity, do you just randomly pick, or do you mm -hmm. base it off of some prior right. knowledge? Uh, no, well, you, you use it, right, so the <coughs> example, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of cases, oops, wrong, wrong program here. Lots of cases of that, but like the one I, I showed was, um, let's see if I get back to it, with those different versions of of, with the pictures, here we go. Okay, so here's uh, basically of. Okay, so it's a very, very ambiguous word. Of can, can, can mean so many different things. Um, and what it's doing here is essentially saying that based on the, if you basically have A of B, and based on the type of A and the type of B, you get a different interpretation. Okay, so if something's a container of something, so a bowl of, a box of, whatever, right, that's, it may, may not always, but, you know, that's like more likely than just picking randomly, it's going to be, a containment relation. But if you say like a picture of or a photo of or something, then it's basically it's representation. So um, that's the kind of thing. So basically there's the, you know, you can have, um, look at properties and objects. If you know those, then you can disambiguate. If you don't know the properties of objects, then you can't. Yeah. Right? So it, it still takes a, a lot of like meta, yeah. meta tag, uh, right. you get like head of a hammer, head of a cow. Oh, for hammer, parts, right, yes, exactly. Right. So that's something WordNet can help you with because it has parts on things. And, um, but yeah, it's not, it's sparse. All these things are sparse. They don't have, you know, they don't have all the parts that you would want, you know, to be known. But at least there's something there. And so we want to augment that. You know, we're adding, you know, sort of parts to it. Also, the 3D objects themselves have parts on them. So when you get a 3D object, um, it comes with, you know, the, the guy who modeled it will, you know, sort of map certain areas as being parts. So this one is, you know, there's the head, and then, you know, there might be the ears. Well, again, it's haphazard there because not every object is going to have every part a separate set of polygons. It might be a dozen of them or five or sometimes a lot, maybe sometimes too many parts that you can't really use them. Right. But the more, the more knowledge you have, you can use, you know, then it's all useful because then you can differentiate the meaning. Right. So if you don't know cows have heads, you couldn't do that. Right. One more question. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're trying to generate three D seems very hard. You, mm -hmm. you have a, I'm sure, a limited amount of objects, and right. um, you know, imagine if you have the Google Image Database, mm -hmm. um, something like that. You have a lot of data. Could you produce images from descriptions that are better than this? Oh, I mean, just picking an existing image, you're saying? No. Or? Let's say I give you a paragraph, you mm -hmm. get an image. But in the Google Image Database, I mean, those are already, those are existing images, right? So the yes. So uh, right. you know, I'm saying you, know, you fetch, you have the internet, and right. somehow you have tagged images. A uh -huh. lot of them segment through. Or I'm sure there's more data. But see, the thing is, you can't. I mean, this is you know, this works by taking different objects. If you say that you know the cat is three feet, it didn't work exactly right. But the table's one and a half feet in front of the couch, right? In 3D objects, you can just move it, right? In an image, you can't because it's just pixels, right? Well, you could put them together. Uh, you oh, know, okay, so you're, you're saying if you had a cutout for every object, maybe, but even then, because it, it, it's not really, it's at a, it's a, photographs at a certain perspective, right? But so, I give you three billion pictures of cats? If you have three billion pictures of cats, and then you pick a different one, I, I, I think there'd be a lot of, yeah, yeah, right, I think there'd be problems, because, you know, at this point of view, it might be this one, but then I want to move back a little, and this, this angle, and that other, that image isn't available at this angle because it's only one angle that one's at. So I have to pick a different cat suddenly. So as you rotate, you get a different cat flying in. So, plus there's just the problems of, you know, um, putting it in the 3D scene you know, where, you know, there might be, well, I mean, you have to extract all the objects around it first off, right? So you have the, I mean, like I showed one example where we had the, um, the cutout guy of the, next to the Santa Claus someplace. Okay, so this guy is, this is kind of what you're talking about, like that farmer, right? Yeah. He's created from an image. So, um, but we sort of did that by hand. You know, we said, that, I mean, it's not that hard to do it. You know, you bring it into Photoshop and you create an outline and you create a match channel and then save it. Um, but to do that automatically on just, you know, photographs is hard unless it's, you know, you know, that's a very hard problem, I think. I don't know much about image processing, but, you know, or, or computer vision, that's really what that is. You're trying to say, here's a real picture in the world what's the actual cutout image for some objects are in it, which you'd even, I mean, how do you know that? I, I don't, I don't, that seems beyond kind of what can be done. But, I mean, if you, and, but then the other, and it's just the problem then is like once you have it, you, then you have a flat thing. So it's not going to be, it won't render the same way. You can't make it, you know, have, so, 
uh, oh, uh, reflections will be the same. You know, I was so asking if yeah. the desired result is an image rather than a 3D scene. If, if what? If the if you if, if your system is modified so that you want to produce an image, right, you right, produce an image instead of a 3D scene. Right. right? Although it is, I mean, it's it's kind of creating it is producing an image. It's just via a 3D scene. So the kind of creates a 3D scene and then renders that to create the image. And because you go to the intermediate state of a 3D scene, you get a lot of flexibility in moving objects around. Whereas if you just went from images to images, you're much more constrained in what you can do because they're, you know, one point of view and you have to extract them somehow. But yeah, it'd probably be possible to do something, but it'd be you know just a lot more constrained, I think. Yeah. Thanks, Bob.